Hello everyone. Last time we spoke about Alexstrasza becoming the Dragon Queen, the creation of the Dragon Soul during the War of the Ancients, and then her enslavement to the Orcs. Her consort Coriostras was able to liberate her. The Aspects have regained their power, but in the case of Melagos, they did not immediately mean the return of his sanity. That would come a few years later, and with clarity of mind, he saw that the world of Azeroth, it was abuse in magic. It was this abuse that had caused them so much suffering back in the War of the Ancients. And it was this abuse that continued to cause problems for the world. They couldn't be trusted with it. So Melagos the Blue decided to draw in all the ley lines into his base of the Nexus. Ronin and the Kirantor found out about this, took their magical floating city of Daladon to Northend to deal with the problem. As this conflict intensified, Alexstrasza and ambassadors from the other Dragonflights, they met to discuss Melagos' fate. Even some of the Blues did not agree what their aspect was doing. He already killed too many innocents, and his siphoning of Azeroth's ley lines, it had upset the balance of the worlds. With heavy hearts, they decided to join the Nexus War, an agreement that become known as the Wormrest Accords. For the good of the world, the dragons would aid mortals in their battle. A decision that was not easily made, especially not for Alexstrasza. Melagos was like a brother to her, and as a guardian of life, she hated the bloodshed that was to come. Yet, if she did nothing, she knew the number of life lost would be unimaginable. Unthinkable! The mortals will destroy everything! My sister, what have you- I did what I had to, brother. You gave me no alternative. And so ends the Nexus War. With Melagos' death, the Blue Dragonflight campaign was put to an end. Members of the Kirantor would spend years to reverse the damage that he had done to Azeroth's ley lines, but eventually they would restore them to the former power. Now, while in Northrend, Melagos was of course not the only threat we had to deal with. There was also Arvis the Lich King, the old god Yuxeron, but also the Forsaken, while the Alliance and Horde united to assault the Rothgate. Grand Apothecary Putris decided that this was their best time to strike, unleash the developed plague upon Arthas and claim their vengeance, taking many of the Alliance and Horde in the process. The plague would have spread throughout the entire region, destroyed whomever it touched, if not for the Red Dragonflight. Alexstrasza and her servants descended from the skies and purified the land with their enchanted fire. They could not save the fallen, but they did eradicate the plague. Now what is rather curious is the conversation that she has with Coriostras. He asks her if they know, and she tells him no, my beloved, followed by a line of Draconic. Roughly translated, it means they must not discover the fate of the young paladin. Not yet. That young paladin, being both her four dragon, seared by dragon flame, taken by the Lich King, to then, at the end of the expansion, pick up the Helmet of Domination and become the Jailer of the Damned. Postpone the plans, as we now know, of the Jailer itself. But what exactly did the dragons turn Bolvar into, and why was he the only one to come back with the Dragon Flame? Did the aspect of life already work against dangers that we didn't even know about until recently? I really wonder. It would be cool if there's some kind of connection there. Next to that, there is another purifying healing quest to be found in Orphans. We have Crusader Bride and Bread, which is a tribute to the real-life Bride and Becker's battle against this illness. We're asked by High Lord Tyrion Fordring to locate the hero, and as it turns out, the plague of undeath has gripped him. That's why he refuses to come with us, not wanted to share his fate with those near him. We go around trying to find some way to cure this devoted of the light, which eventually has us ask Alexstrasza for aid. In this dark time, she will not be the one to abandon a champion of the light. Outside the ruby dragon shrine, we collect Dahlia's tears, new life that grows where her ruby keepers set flame to the ground beneath undead feet. It's named after Dahlia's son Touch, a former high elf keeper who offered herself to Alexstrasza in life and found her ends at the hands of the death knight Bloodbane. With the flower, the dragon queen grants us the breath of Alexstrasza. While cleansing the body in favor of life anew, it is something well within her grasp. Removing the plague of undeath without affecting the body, that's beyond the scope of the power she controls. Still, we give it our best shot. A painful experience for Bride and Brad. Yet still, that, that curse of undead, it's a stubborn one. Ultimately, we are unable to save him. 
But the light takes care of their own, making sure that bride and bread shall not endure the corruption of undeath. He shall taste only paradise. A beautiful small questline. A tribute which I did really want to mention. But at last, the whole of Azeroth will break. After dealing with the Lich King, Deathwing the Destroyer returns to bring about the Hour of Twilight. The moment in which the old gods will break out of their prisons and rule the world once more. Again, their fallen brother poses a world-ending threat. And while it saddens her greatly, judgment is final. Deathwing, the horrific creature that was once the Earth Warder and once her friends, must be destroyed. Easier said than done though, as Deathwing is becoming more and more empowered by the one signing his paychecks, the old god Nazoth. Still, the Dragon Queen makes ready to take him on at the familiar redoubt within the Twilight Highlands, a clash of titanic dragons that we get to be a part of. Mortal, I want you to bear witness to this, but for your own safety, stay back. Kaelin, you too. I will not leave your side. Your life isn't yours to throw away, Kaelin. Should I fail, the fate of this world may rest on your shoulders. Yes, Mother. Life Binder, do you presume that I am at your beck and call? I have a world to unmake. It pains me, Neltharion, but I must end you, as I have ended Malagos. <laughs> end me, Life Binder. You think life is yours to take away? Life is weak, mortal, fleeting, fragile. Death is final. Death is eternal. Death is my realm. Look upon me, and you see death incarnate, the unmaker of worlds. I see the hollow metal shell of a once great ally, and the precious gift of the Titans wasted. Then witness my new gifts, bestowed by this world's true masters! With the battle taking her to the skies over Grim Batol, the plan unravels a bit, as she was supposed to take him on within the circle of life that was prepared. We'll have to lend a hand and shoot down any of the Twilight Drakes that are aiding the mad aspect. They've fallen! The Earth Warder... He is dead. Mother, stay still. Your wounds are great. The Black Aspect's blood is cursed. Wherever it was shed, nothing will grow for ten thousand years. <laughs> But it is over. We can work now to bottle up the horrors he has unleashed. Deathwing! He lives! Impossible! Mortal! Take the Dragon Queen! Carry her to safety! Now! Run! Get her away from here! I will delay the aspect of death! Take her to safety! Go! Kaelin! No! The sun has set on this mortal world, fools. 
Make peace with your end, for the hour of twilight falls. Deathwing's defeat wasn't going to be that easy. We still had a whole expansion to go through after all. Alex Raza called upon her fellow remaining aspects to meet up at the Wormless Temple. Her hope was to bring order to the scattered Dragonflights, unite them to fight against Deathwing. The perfect opportunity for the mad aspect to strike. Twilight dragons descended from the skies and kept them busy at the top. Meanwhile, down below, in their sacred sanctums where they kept all their eggs, the Twilight Hammer infiltrated and began to transform the unhatched creatures into Twilight Dragons. It would have been a great success, was it not for the presence of Kresses. He had suggested to his queen to stay behind while she dealt with the meeting. He tried his very best to defend their sanctum, their unborn children, but soon enough discovered that it was already too late. Not just for the red dragon eggs, all the sanctums had been infected. There was nothing he could do for them except give all that he had. It was a terrible choice. He knew that it was likely that no one else would ever know what had really happened, that without knowing the truth, Others might deem him a traitor, that perhaps even his beloved queen would believe it. And still, he made the choice. Coriolstras gathered up all his energy and magic, folding in on himself. He took a deep, steadying breath and whispered a single word. Beloved. The explosion that followed was powerful enough to send Alexstrasza hurling head over tail through the air. The attackers withdrew and, upon investigating, the other dragons realized the tragedy that had taken place. All their sanctums were gone, as if they had never been, and along with the sanctums were the unspeakably precious treasures they housed. They're young. Thousands of lives had been snuffed out before they even had a chance to breathe air or flex their wings. Alexstrasza reached out with her heart, her life-binding magic, her depthless love, trying to find a trace of the one who had been first in her heart. Their bond was so great that even if he had been spirited away somehow, if he lived she would sense him, she had always been able to before. Coriastras? Silence. Beloved? Nothing. Alexstrasza had lost her mate, her children, and her hope. All in one terrible blow. Even worse, the others were wondering what Coriolstras' involvement had been. Why had he blown up their sanctums? Could he have secretly been working for Deathwing? It was a thought that she didn't even want to consider. He had always been the best of them, but the others didn't rule out any possibilities. The Red Dragon Queen snapped and had to get away from those, so quick to believe the worst of one who had always been the best of them. Yet a small sliver of doubt crept into her heart. What if it was actually true? Flying all the way to Desolus, the place where she wanted to end it all. No longer would she eat or drink, simply wait until death claimed her. In the meantime, a big old story plays out with Warchief's thrall journey into becoming Goel. He'd been working with the Shaman of the Urver Ring to try and heal the wounds which was left behind by Deathwing breaking out. His efforts weren't going too great. He was feeling torn between his role as Warchief and the going-ons amongst the Hordes, and then his role here as Shaman. It was Ysera who placed him on a quest that would eventually have him help out the other aspects and the dragons. He assisted Nosdormu, scattered across time. He assisted the Blues with picking Caligos as their brand new aspect and leader. He also assisted Alexstrasza to deal with her grief. The spirit of life had honored him with a vision that he was meant to share with the queen. A vision on what went down within the sanctums, revealing the truth behind Coriolstras' actions. Her heart cracked open as tears welled in her eyes while she grieved for her lost love, finally weeping the healing tears that had been locked inside her shuddered heart. Thrall put an arm around her shoulders and she turned into his broad chest. She who had once been tortured and enslaved by orcs to serve them, wept freely against him. Her tears seemed endless, as the tears of the life binder ought to be. It was more than the loss of Cressus, for all suspected. He sensed she wept for all things that had fallen, for the innocent and the guilty, for Melagos and Deathwing, and for all they had harmed, for the corrupted children, who had never had a chance to truly live, for the dead and the living. For all those who suffered and tasted the salty tang of their pain on their cheeks, they came freely now, her weeping as natural and pure as breathing. You've reminded me of things that, in my pain, I had forgotten. 
things he would not wish me to forget ever. From pain we draw strength. There was more grieving to be done for all that had been lost, and he knew that she would do so. But not now. Now the lifebinder was using her pain to fuel action, not tears, and Frau almost felt a twing of pity for those who would feel the heat of her fury. Alex Straza would go on to reunite with the others, kicking some massive twilight booty and deal with the Freda Chromatis. After which, the aspects were eager to directly take on Deathwing. But first, the world needed a bit of healing. At Mount Hyjal, the place where millennia ago they had planted the World Tree Nordrasil to contain the powers of the well. A World Tree that was then blown up to defeat Archimon during Warcraft 3. That tree could be used as a great tool to heal the world itself. It was already slowly healing after being blown up, but not quite fast enough. By infusing it with their own power, they hoped that Nordrasil would be restored to its former glory. Now for all, helping out the aspects the way he did, it put a bit of a target on his back. While getting ready to perform their ritual, our former war chief is split into the different elements, then scattered across the elemental planes. We bring him back, together with his beloved Agra. And in-game, we got to witness their wedding. Not the only wedding that Alexstrasza was part of either. Earlier, she had presided over the wedding between Melfurion and Toronto, finally blessing the elves' new world tree of Teldrassil, which... Ultimately, I guess it proved to be a bit pointless. Well, right here, they also finished their original task. Nordrasil's wounds were healed, and new life pulsed through his limbs. The Espex were pleased with their work, but this was just patching up a wound. The real cause, Deathwing. He was still out there. Not the same creature as they had fought at Grim Patrol. Not with that much void energy running through his veins. To defeat him, they would have to unmake him. Destroy every portion of his essence. Kaelic thought of a way to do it, but it wasn't going to be easy. We were going to have to go back in time to dwarf the ancients, pick up the dragon soul, bring it then back to our time period where Thrall could use the relic, use it against his very own creator. Not only that, but he could also use his shamanistic abilities to infuse the element of earth into the artifacts, which would make Deathwing especially vulnerable to its power. Nuzov sensed that his servant was on the verge of defeat. The old god's plans were unraveling, and it made one final, desperate attempt to turn the tide, infusing Deathwing with more of its power, more than the old gods had ever given the Black Dragon aspect before. The influx of energy, it was so great that Deathwing's unstable body wrenched apart, and molten tentacles unfurled from his broken hide. Excellent work! The fire of my heart glows with a brilliant purity unmatched! Every spark of it I will channel into the Dragon Soul. The Dragon Aspects sacrificed all the remaining power to the artifacts. Their essences, combined with Thrall's elements of Earth, it seared through Deathwing. The explosive power annihilated his tormented mind and body. Together, they managed to stop Nazoth's plans for the moment. But the time of dragons was over. They would remain active in the affairs of the world, but with their powers diminished, they could no longer serve as Azra's protectors. The champions who fought at our side assured the survival of our world. But now, we must see it with mortal eyes. We dragon aspects have fulfilled our great purpose and our ancient power is expended. But though our day draws to an end, life endures and new generations will be born. The job now fell upon the mortals who had more than earned it. Being empowered by the titans, it had brought about a lot of good for the dragons, but also a lot of pain and suffering. On top of that, it was once said that the dragons also lost their ability to reproduce, which was a bit of a dick move to make someone a life binder, only to then fulfill their so-called ultimate purpose, to then take away the ability to actually give life. Thankfully, Blizzard has gone back on that decision, not wanting to fully close the chapter on dragons. Now fast forward a few years into Battle for Azeroth, a time in which the world is severely wounded and the old god Nazov works on breaking out of his prison once more. These mighty mortals have been blessed or cursed depending on who you ask with the heart of Azeroth. With it, they've been able to gather Azerite to patch her up a bit, but Azeroth is still cascading towards terminal failure. We're going to need to amplify the heart, infuse it with magical essences. The world gonna need the dragons once more. 
though Caligos managed to reach the other aspects, he hasn't heard back from Alex Straza. Together, we travel to the familiar redoubt to find out what is going on. Turns out that the Red Dragonflight is under attack by Vexiona and her void twisted Twilight Dragons. What are they doing to my children? Life Binder. Give in to the whispers. Join us and you will be granted power beyond measure. Never! Alex Straza and I will focus on Bexiona. Do what you can to save the captives. Behold the future of all dragon flights. United as one. You will see the truth as I have, sister. You are not my sister. Why do you resist, sister? Do you not see the grand destiny that awaits our kind? The power you were promised will not protect you from me! There is but one way this can end, champion. Prepare for a fight. It seems Alex Raza just can't shake Grimp at all. Is that where we confront Vexiona, forcing her to retreat, saving the Dragon Queen's children. We have more than earned her support, a lost skill of the Scarlet Broodmother, which is added to our hearts. Long has my flight protected all life on Azeroth, and so shall we continue for as long as we draw breath. Accept this gift. May it light a flame within you, to burn bright through the darkest times. She'd hang out in the chambers a bit longer, talking with Marifra, daughter of her sister Ysera, a sister that has fallen to darkness and moved on to the Shadowlands. After saving the world from the Zoth within battle for Azeroth, we also moved on into that domain, where Ysera becomes connected with Arden Wield. Now she of the dream serves the Winter Queen and on our quest of saving Toronto Whisperwinds. We're going to need the aid of Kadaran and Tyrannex. But Kadaran, they were hit by a curse, and True Love's Kiss did nothing to save them. A more powerful ritual was going to be needed, one which required a token of lost love. Ysera believes that her sister Alexstrasza is going to be able to provide such a thing, considering the huge loss of love that she had when Coriolstras made the ultimate sacrifice. A fun side note on this questline, Death Knights out there that do it, they are kindly reminded by the Dragon Queen of their actions against her flight in the past. Alexstrasza's eyes narrow, her teeth and claws seem to gleam just a tad more sharply. You have a great deal of nerve coming here, Death Knight. What do you wish to take from the Dragonflight this time? That's calling back to the Legion time period, in which Death Knights of the world, they went out to get their special class mount, the Vile Brood Vanquisher. Both the Lich King could sense power, remains of a dragon out there somewhere, but his location remained a mystery. We were going to need some information, which the dragons weren't willing to share, so we took it by force, infiltrating the Ruby Sanctum in search of knowledge. And while there, the Lich King gave us a choice. We could spare them or slay them all, embrace the Death Knight that's lurking inside, slaughtering all the rats, which used to give the Unholy Determination achievements but they've since removed it from the game. Still, Alex Chaza remembers what the Death Knight did. Noticing if you approach with the Vile Brood, she'll frown in disappointment. But yeah, Ysera, for all the other classes, she thought the Coriostras would be the one that Alex Chaza thinks of when speaking about a token of lust love. But instead... Ysera, it brightens my heart to know her death was not an end, but a new beginning. We were sisters, hatched from the same clutch, inseparable since birth. Ysera speaks of Coriolstras, whom I loved dearly, but I loved none more than her. She gave me a gift when we first became Aspects. Take it with you, and save your friend. And Champion... Please tell my sister that she is sorely missed, fondly remembered, and deeply loved. This small carving of Ysera, which has been kept by the Dragon Queen for millennia, 
It's granted to us to help lift the curse and push forward. We're trying to save Toronto. That's pretty much where Alexstrasza's story is at for the moment. The Lifebinder. All dragons, to be honest, but Alexstrasza especially, they have a tragic story. Some of the things she went through while fulfilling a role as aspect of life are some of the darker stories that you'll find on Azeroth. And yet through it all, she's been able to hold on to her love of life, showing kindness and compassion to creatures that some might discard as lesser races. I truly wonder if her actions with Bolvar, if they're going to play some part in the story of the Shadowlands. The balance must be maintained. So far, we've been dealing a whole bunch with the aspect of death, but what about its counterparts? Could there be a reunion for the sisters in the future? Similar to how we're looking forward to the Winter Queen meeting up with her sister, is Coriolstra's spirit somewhere in the Shadowlands that could make for one heck of a moment? But time is going to tell. For now, you're up to date on the story of Alex Raza. So thank you very much for watching, everyone. Really hope you enjoyed our deep dive into the story of the Queen of the Dragons. Subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and until next time, see ya!